Chapter One of Agnes Gray. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Libby Gone. Agnes Gray by Anne Bronte. Chapter One The Parsonage. All true histories contain instruction though in some the treasure may be hard to find and when found so trivial in quantity that the dry shrivelled kernel scarcely compensates for the trouble of cracking the nut whether this be the case with my history or not i am hardly competent to judge i sometimes think it might prove useful to some and entertaining to others but the world may judge for itself shielded by my own obscurity and by the lapse of years and a few fictitious names i do not fear to venture and will candidly lay before the public what i would not disclose to the most intimate friends my father was a clergyman in the north of england who was deservedly respected by all who knew him and in his younger days lived pretty comfortably on the joint income of a small incumbency and a snug little property of his own my mother who married him against the wishes of her friends was a squire's daughter and a woman of spirit in vain it was represented to her that if she became the poor parson's wife she must relinquish her carriage and her lady's maid and all the luxuries and elegancies of affluence which to her were little less than necessaries of life a carriage and a lady's maid were great conveniences but thank heaven she had feet to carry her and hands to minister to her own necessities an elegant house and spacious grounds were not to be despised but she would rather live in a cottage with richard gray than in a palace with any other man in the world finding arguments of no avail her father at length told the lovers they might marry if they pleased but in so doing his daughter would forfeit every fraction of her fortune he expected this would cool the ardour of both, but he was mistaken. My father knew too well my mother's superior worth not to be sensible that she was a valuable fortune in herself, and if she would but content to embellish his humble hearth, he should be happy to take her on any terms, while she, on her part, would rather labour with her own hands than be divided from the man she loved, whose happiness it would be her joy to make and who was already one with her in heart and soul. So her fortune went to swell the purse of a wiser sister, who had married a rich nabob, and she, to the wonder and compassionate regret of all who knew her, went to bury herself in the homely village parsonage among the hills of blank. And yet, in spite of all this, and in spite of my mother's high spirit and my father's whims, I believe you might search all England through, and fail to find a happier couple. Of six children, my sister Mary and myself were the only ones that survived the perils of infancy and early childhood. I, being the younger by five or six years, was always regarded as the child and the pet of the family. Father, mother, and sister all combined to spoil me, not by foolish indulgence, to render me fractious and ungovernable, but by ceaseless kindness to make me too helpless and dependent, too unfit for buffeting with the cares and turmoils of life. Mary and I were brought up in the strictest seclusion, my mother, being at once highly accomplished, well informed, and fond of enjoyment, took the whole charge of our education on herself, with the exception of Latin, which my father undertook to teach us, so that we never even went to school and as there was no society in the neighbourhood our only intercourse with the world consisted in a stately tea-party now and then with the principal farmers and tradespeople of the vicinity just to avoid being stigmatised as too proud to consort with our neighbours and an annual visit to our paternal grandfathers where himself our kind grandmamma a maiden aunt and two or three elderly ladies and gentlemen were the only persons we ever saw sometimes our mother would amuse us with stories and anecdotes of her younger days which while they entertained us amazingly frequently awoke in me at least a secret wish to see a little more of the world i thought she must have been very happy but she never seemed to regret past times my father however 
whose temper was neither tranquil nor cheerful by nature often unduly vexed himself with thinking of the sacrifices his dear wife had made for him and troubled his head with revolving endless schemes for the augmentation of his little fortune for her sake and ours in vain my mother assured him she was quite satisfied and if he would but lay by a little for the children we should all have plenty both for time present and to come but saving was not my father's fort he would not run in debt at least my mother took good care that he should not but while he had money he must spend it he liked to see his house comfortable and his wife and daughters well clothed and well attended and besides he was charitably disposed and liked to give to the poor according to his means or as some might think beyond them at length however a kind friend suggested to him a means of doubling his private property at one stroke and further increasing it hereafter to an untold amount this friend was a merchant a man of enterprising spirit and undoubted talent who was somewhat strained in his mercantile pursuits for want of capital but generously proposed to give my father a fair share of his profits if he would only entrust him with what he could spare and he thought he might safely promise that whatever sum the latter chose to put into his hands it should bring him in cent per cent the small patrimony was speedily sold and the whole of its price was deposited in the hands of the friendly merchant who was promptly proceeded to ship his cargo and prepare for his voyage my father was delighted so were we all with our brightening prospects for the present it is true we were reduced to the narrow income of the curacy but my father seemed to think that there was no necessity for scrupulously restricting our expenditure to that so with a standing bill at mr jackson's and another at smith's and a third at hobson's we got along even more comfortably than before though my mother affirmed we had better keep within bounds for our prospects of wealth were but precarious after all and if my father would only trust everything to her management he should never feel himself stinted but he for once was incorrigible what happy hours mary and i have passed while sitting at our work by the fire or wandering on the heath-clad hills or idling under the weeping birch the only considerable tree in the garden talking of future happiness to ourselves and our parents of what we would do and see and possess with no firmer foundation for our goodly superstructure than the riches that were expected to flow in upon us from the success of the worthy merchant speculations our father was nearly as bad as ourselves only that he affected not to be so much in earnest expressing his bright hopes and sanguine expectations in jests and playful sallies that always struck me as being exceedingly witty and pleasant our mother laughed with delight to see him so hopeful and happy but still she feared he was setting his heart too much upon the matter and once i heard her whisper as she left the room god grant he be not disappointed i know not how he would bear it disappointed he was and bitterly too it came like a thunderclap on us all that the vessel which contained our fortune had been wrecked and had gone to the bottom with all its stores together with several of the crew and the unfortunate merchant himself i was grieved for him i was grieved for the overthrow of all our air-built castles but with the elasticity of youth i soon recovered the shock though riches had charms poverty had no terrors for an inexperienced girl like me indeed to say the truth there was something exhilarating in the idea of being driven to straits and thrown upon our own resources i only wished papa mamma and mary were all of the same mind as myself and then instead of lamenting past calamities we might all cheerfully set to work to remedy them and the greater the difficulties the harder our present privations the greater should be our cheerfulness to endure the latter and our vigour to contend against the former mary did not lament but she brooded continually over our misfortune and sank into a state of dejection from which no effort of mine could rouse her i could not possibly bring her to regard the matter on its bright side as i did and indeed i was so fearful of being charged with childish frivolity or stupid insensibility 
that I carefully kept most of my bright ideas and cheering notions to myself, knowing well they could not be appreciated. My mother thought only of consoling my father, and paying our debts, and retrenching our expenditure by every available means. But my father was completely overwhelmed by the calamity. Health, strength, and spirits sank beneath the blow, and he never wholly recovered them. In vain my mother strove to cheer him, by appealing to his piety, to his courage, to his affection for herself and us. That very affection was his greatest torment. It was for our sakes he had so ardently longed to increase his fortune. It was our interest that had lent such brightness to his hopes, and that imparted such bitterness to his present distress. He now tormented himself with remorse at having neglected my mother's advice, which would at least have saved him from the additional burden of debt. He vainly reproached himself for having brought her from the dignity, the ease, the luxury of her former station, to toil with him through the cares and toils of poverty. It was gall and wormwood to his soul to see that splendid, highly accomplished woman, once so courted and admired, transformed into an active managing housewife, with hands and head continually occupied with household labours and household economy. The very willingness with which she performed these duties, the cheerfulness with which she bore her reverses, and the kindness which withheld her from imputing the smallest blame to him, were all perverted by this ingenious self-tormentor into further aggravation of his sufferings. And thus the mind preyed upon the body, and disordered the system of the nerves, and they in turn increased the troubles of the mind, till by action and reaction his health was seriously impaired, and not one of us could convince him that the aspect of our affairs was not half so gloomy, so utterly hopeless, as his morbid imagination represented it to be. The useful pony Phaeton was sold, together with the stout, well-fed pony, the old favourite that we had fully determined should end its days in peace and never pass from our hands. The little coach-house and stable were let, the servant-boy and the more efficient, being the more expensive of the two maid-servants, were dismissed. Our clothes were mended, turned, and darned to the utmost verge of decency. Our food, always plain, was now simplified to an unprecedented degree, except my father's favourite dishes. Our coals and candles were painfully economised. The pair of candles reduced to one, and that most sparingly used. The coals carefully husbanded in the half-empty grate, especially when my father was out in his parish duties, were confined to bed through illness. Then we sat with our feet on the fender, scraping the perishing embers together from time to time, and occasionally adding a slight scattering of the dust and fragments of coal, just to keep them alive. As for our carpets, they in time were worn threadbare, and patched and darned even to a greater extent than our garments. To save the expense of a gardener, Mary and I undertook to keep the garden in order, and all the cooking and household work that could not easily be managed by one servant-girl was done by my mother and sister, with a little occasional help from me, only a little, because, though a woman in my own estimation, I was still a child in theirs, and my mother, like most active managing women, was not gifted with very active daughters. For this reason, that being so clever and diligent herself, she was never tempted to trust her affairs to a deputy, but on the contrary was willing to act and think for others as well as for number one. And whatever was the business at hand, she was apt to think that no one could do it so well as herself, so that whenever I offered to assist her, I received such an answer as, No, love, you cannot indeed. There's nothing here you can do. Go and help your sister, or get her to take a walk with you. Tell her she must not sit so much, and stay so constantly in the house as she does. She may well look thin and dejected. Mary, Mamma says I'm to help you, or get you to take a walk with me. She says you may well look thin and dejected if you sit so constantly in the house. Help me you cannot, Agnes, and I cannot go out with you. I have far too much to do. Then let me help you. You cannot indeed, dear child. Go and practice your music, or play with the kitten. There was always plenty of sewing on hand, but I had not been taught to cut out a single garment, 
and except plain hemming and seeming there was little I could do, even in that line, for they both asserted that it was far easier to do the work themselves than to prepare it for me. And besides, they liked better to see me prosecuting my studies or amusing myself. It was time enough for me to sit bending over my work, like a grave matron, when my favourite little pussy was become a steady old cat. Under such circumstances, although I was not many degrees more useful than the kitten, my idleness was not entirely without excuse. Through all our troubles, I never but once heard my mother complain of our want of money. As summer was coming on, she observed to Mary and me, what a desirable thing would it be for your papa to spend a few weeks at a watering-place i am convinced the sea air and the change of scene would be of incalculable service to him but then you see there's no money she added with a sigh we both wished exceedingly that the thing might be done and lamented greatly that it could not well well said she there's no use complaining possibly something might be done to further the project after all mary you are a beautiful drawer what do you say to doing a few more pictures in your best style and getting them framed with the water-colour drawings you have already done and trying to dispose of them to some liberal picture dealer who has the sense to discern their merits mamma i should be delighted if you think they could be sold for anything worth while it's worth well trying however my dear do you procure the drawings and i'll endeavour to find a purchaser I wish I could do something, I said. You, Agnes? Well, who knows? You draw pretty well, too. If you choose some simple piece for your subject, I dare say you will be able to produce something we shall all be proud to exhibit. But I have another scheme in my head, Mamma, and have had long, only I did not like to mention it. Indeed, pray tell us what it is. I should like to be a governess. My mother uttered an exclamation of surprise and laughed. My sister dropped her work in astonishment, exclaiming, "'You, a governess, Agnes! What can you be dreaming of?' "'Well, I don't see anything so very extraordinary in it. I do not pretend to be able to instruct great girls, but surely I could teach little ones. And I should like it so much. I am so fond of children. Do let me, mamma but my love you have not learned to take care of yourself yet and young children require more judgment and experience to manage than elder ones but mamma i am above eighteen and quite capable to take care of myself and others too you do not know half the wisdom and prudence i possess because i have never been tried only think said mary what would you do in a house full of strangers without me or mamma to speak and act for you with a parcel of children besides yourself to attend to, and no one to look to for advice. You would not even know what clothes to put on. You think, because I always do as you bid me, that I have no judgment of my own. But only try me. That is all I ask, and you shall see what I can do. At that moment my father entered, and the subject of our discussion was explained to him. What? My little Agnes a governess? cried he and in spite of his dejection he laughed at the idea. "'Yes, papa. Don't you say anything against it. I should like it so much, and I am sure I could manage delightfully.' "'But, my darling, we could not spare you.' And a tear glistened in his eye as he added, "'No, no. Afflicted as we are, surely we are not brought to that pass yet.' "'Oh, no,' said my mother. "'There is no necessity whatever for such a step.' It is merely a whim of her own. So you must hold your tongue, you naughty girl, for, though you are so ready to leave us, you know very well we cannot part with you. I was silenced for that day, and for many succeeding ones, but still I did not wholly relinquish my darling scheme. Mary got her drawing materials and steadily set to work. I got mine too, but while I drew I thought of other things. How delightful it would be to be a governess, to go out into the world, to enter upon a new life, to act for myself, to exercise my unused faculties, to try my unknown powers, to earn my own maintenance, and something to comfort and help my father, mother, and sister, besides exonerating them from the provision of my food and clothing, to show papa what his little Agnes could do, 
to convince mamma and mary that i was not quite the helpless thoughtless being they supposed and then how charming to be entrusted with the care and education of children whatever the other said i felt i was fully competent to the task the clear remembrance of my own thoughts in early childhood would be a surer guide than the instructions of the most mature adviser i had but to turn from my little pupils to myself at their age and i should know at once how to win their confidence and affections how to waken the contrition of the erring how to embolden the timid and console the afflicted how to make virtue practicable instruction desirable and religion lovely and comprehensible delightful task to teach the young idea how to shoot to train the tender plants and watch their buds unfolding day by day influenced by so many inducements i determined still to persevere though the fear of displeasing my mother or distressing my father's feelings prevented me from resuming the subject for several days at length again i mentioned it to my mother in private and with some difficulty got her to promise to assist me with her endeavours my father's reluctant consent was next obtained and then though mary still sighed her disapproval my dear kind mother began to look out for a situation for me she wrote to my father's relations and consulted the newspaper advertisements her own relations she had long since dropped all communication with a formal interchange of occasional letters was all she had ever had since her marriage and she would not at any time have applied to them in a case of this nature but so long and so entire had been my parents seclusion from the world that many weeks elapsed before a suitable situation could be procured at last to my great joy it was decreed that i should take charge of the young family of a certain mrs bloomfield whom my kind prim aunt gray had known in her youth and asserted to be a very nice woman her husband was a retired tradesman who had realized a very comfortable fortune but could not be prevailed upon to give a greater salary than twenty-five pounds to the instructress of his children i however was glad to accept this rather than refuse the situation which my parents were inclined to think the better plan but some weeks more were yet to be devoted to preparation how long how tedious those weeks appeared to me yet they were happy ones in the main full of bright hopes and ardent expectations with what peculiar pleasure i assisted at the making of my new clothes and subsequently the packing of my trunks but there was a feeling of bitterness mingling with the latter occupation too and when it was done when all was ready for my departure on the morrow and the last night at home approached a sudden anguish seemed to swell my heart my dear friends looked so sad and spoke so very kindly that i could scarcely keep my eyes from overflowing but i still affected to be gay i had taken my last ramble with mary on the moors my last walk in the garden and round the house i had fed with her our pet pigeons for the last time the pretty creatures that we had tamed to peck their food from our hands i had given a farewell stroke to all their silky backs as they crowded in my lap i had tenderly kissed my own peculiar favourites a pair of snow-white fantails i had played my last tune on the old familiar piano and had sung my last song to papa not the last i hoped but the last for what appeared to me a very long time and perhaps when i did these things again it would be with different feelings circumstances might be changed and this house might never be my settled home again my dear little friend the kitten would certainly be changed she was already growing a fine cat and when i returned even for a hasty visit at christmas would most likely have forgotten both her playmates and her merry pranks i had romped with her for the last time and when i stroked her soft bright fur while she lay purring herself to sleep in my lap it was with a feeling of sadness i could not easily disguise then at bedtime when i retired with mary to our quiet little chamber where already my drawers were cleared out and my share of the bookcase was empty and where hereafter she would have to sleep alone in dreary solitude as she expressed it my heart sank more than ever i felt as if i had been selfish and wrong to persist in leaving her 
and when I knelt once more beside our little bed, I prayed for a blessing on her and on my parents more fervently than I had ever done before. To conceal my emotion, I buried my face in my hands, and they were presently bathed in tears. I perceived on rising that she had been crying too, but neither of us spoke, and in silence we betook ourselves to our repose, creeping more closely together from the consciousness that we were to part so soon. But the morning brought a renewal of hope and spirits. I was to depart early, that the conveyance which took me, a gig hired for Mr. Smith, the draper, grocer, and tea-dealer of the village, might return the same day. I rose, washed, dressed, swallowed a hasty breakfast, received the fond embraces of my father, mother, and sister, kissed the cat, to the great scandal of Sally, the maid, shook hands with her, mounted the gig, drew my veil over my face, and then, but not till then, burst into a flood of tears. The gig rolled on. I looked back. My dear mother and sister were still standing at the door, looking after me, waving their adieu. I returned their salute, and prayed God to bless them from my heart. We descended the hill, and I could see them no more. "'Tis a coldish morning for you, Miss Agnes,' observed Smith. "'A darksome one, too. But we's happened to get to yon spot afore there come much rain to signify.' "'Yes, I hope so,' I replied, as calmly as I could. "'It's comed up a good sop last night, too.' "'Yes, but this cold wind will happen to keep it off. "'Perhaps it will.' "'Here ended our colloquy. "'We crossed the valley and began to ascend the opposite hill. "'As we were toiling up, I looked back again. "'There was the village spire, and the old grey parsonage beyond it, "'basking in a slanting beam of sunshine.' It was but a sickly ray, but the village and surrounding hills were all in sombre shade, and I hailed the wandering beam as a propitious omen to my home. With clasped hands I fervently implored a blessing on its inhabitants, and hastily turned away, for I saw the sunshine was departing, and I carefully avoided another glance, lest I should see it in gloomy shadow, like the rest of the landscape. End of chapter 1